Um, now, as we continue our discussion of the current challenges and the opportunities for physician leadership and payment reform, I'd like to introduce Dr. Darshak Sangavi, who is a pediatric, pediatric cardiologist, a prolific writer, and a new addition as a uh, fellow and managing director here at Brookings in our expanding programs on clinician leadership. Uh, he is leading the development of some new tools to help clinicians make sense of the changes that are taking place and uh, actually engage in some of that uh, leadership that we've just been hearing about. Dr. Sangavi? Just going to show some pictures, so hopefully this will come up. Well, welcome. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. And some of you who watch the news um, have probably seen some interesting questions that were brought up, really about comp uh, specific clinical problems. Um, so you've uh, probably been following this news that the cholesterol guidelines recently changed. And uh, it's complicated, right? We used to follow, well, what was your LDL cholesterol? That's what uh, you went to your doctor to, to have done. And that's all been changed. And if you ask, well, what, what's really the upshot of this, the answer is going to be talk to your doctor. They'll, they'll tell you, they'll, they'll sort of work this out with you. But remember, what they're actually asking you to do is go see your doctor. They're going to take your information, put it into this statistical model, and give you a 10-year risk of having a heart attack. If that risk is greater than 7.5%, you're going to be asked to take a statin. That's going to be the new guideline. As you may have heard, the risk calculator also turns out has some problems with its regression analysis. So it's going to need to be modified a little bit. I just summed up what that conversation is supposed to look like in your doctor's office. I'll come back to that in just a minute. Should women get mammograms once they turn 40? Now, this is very complicated as well. Some individuals say yes, some organizations say no. Um, but if you really look at the data, again, it's going to be talk to your doctor. What is your doctor supposed to say? And they could have this conversation with you. If you choose to have a mammogram once you turn the age of 40 regularly, there is approximately a 25% risk that you will have a biopsy at some point during those 10 years. That's a pretty high risk. However, it's also true that about one in 1,000 women's lives appear to be saved if you begin that practice. Again, this demands a very high degree of statistical sophistication to make sense of this. The reason I bring this up and its relation to physician payment reform becomes clear when you say, well, what are we asking people to do? Now, remember uh, um, a, a little while ago, um, we did a survey in the waiting room where, uh, where I work. I'm a pediatric cardiologist. And we asked individuals to answer a very simple question. If you flip a coin 100 times, about how many times will it come up heads? Now, as most of you know, there's two sides to coins. should be about 50-50. Uh, the majority of people guessed about three times or less, or eight times or more. And this data is actually shown even in a big survey done by the Annals of Internal Medicine, where they surveyed approximately 1,000 women, and out of them, the majority said that if you flipped a coin 1,000 times, most likely it would come up less than 300 times as heads or tails. Most were not able to identify 50%. I tell this story again in a great deal of detail because there is a significant disconnect between the way doctors talk to patients and what patients may actually take away from those conversations. So when we talk about shared decision making, getting people to participate, we need to do a better job. The identical problem occurs, and this is where I like to shift focus, when we start saying, well, how do we get doctors more interested in payment reform, in delivery reform? How do we get them to engage in all of these major, major issues that we're talking about today? This is a little Wordle diagram here. For some of you who've seen this, this is where you can, uh, the words are uh, proportionate in size to how often they may show up in some healthcare publications. I show this because we also, um, I, I, I'm a professor at a medical school, we did a survey among uh, residents. So these are individuals who will be fully licensed physicians within a period of one or two years. And we asked a series of very simple questions. The first question was, can you just in brief terms describe the difference between Medicare and Medicaid? 
50% of trainees who are about to get into practice were unable to answer that question to a basic degree of understanding. So I think it's fascinating when we use casually terms like capitation, ACO, Medicare, Medicaid, fee-for-service, those words have very little meaning to the vast majority of people out there who are practicing medicine. In fact, this past weekend, I had dinner with a group of my colleagues who live in Boston. And I said, oh, you know, uh, we're at Brookings. I came here a couple months ago. We're doing this big event on this uh, sustainable growth rate. And just blank stares all around the room. What is SGR? You know, the, they didn't even, they, the, and these were individuals who were the head of uh, the hospitalist medicine group at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, didn't know what SGR was. So I think it's just really interesting that when we start talking about these issues, we are identifying a real problem, which is a significant lack of engagement in healthcare finance, healthcare reform, and healthcare delivery. It's not because doctors don't care, it's just that whenever you read health policy publications, you, it's just, it's not written in a way that really makes a lot of sense. Um, I hate to say it that way, because now I'm writing some of that stuff, but. Um, <laughs> Um, and I think that this is, again, supported by the data. Uh, the Archives of Internal Medicine did a study a little while ago. 50% of medical students today, those are the ones that actually are even taking classes in health policy, are unable to describe the most basic components of the Affordable Care Act. So when we talk about physician engagement, and when we look to clinicians to help lead the reform in delivery in health care, we need to do a better job to educate them, but in a way that meets their needs. So one of the core issues that we here at Brookings are going to engage in is trying to think of innovative ways to handle this knowledge gap. We could do it in traditional ways. We could write white papers. We could publish in Health Affairs. We could publish in JAMA or the New England Journal of Medicine. However, it is unlikely that that methodology is going to reach a large majority of practicing clinicians. How do we get to them? And so what I'd like to describe is one of our first uh, initiatives here um, to address this. Um, this, uh, this may not project great, but that's Sanjay Gupta uh, up there. And this is a guy named Sal Khan. Uh, I have two kids. They're 12 and 9. Um, they uh, take math in school. And math can be a challenging subject for many, many people out there. Sal Khan. Um, was uh, he worked in like finance in New York City. Um, some of you may already know the story. His niece really wasn't getting math at all and was really frustrating uh, because, uh, you know, the, the parents didn't really feel like they could talk to their kids very clearly. The teachers weren't giving a lot of support. So anyway, he made these little um, videos online explaining math. A uh, very, very simple concept. And it was remarkable that that led to their friends sending those videos to other friends, and ultimately uh, Sal uh, created this thing called the Khan Academy. It's essentially an online place you go, very low tech, but they teach you how to do math. It's remarkable, and um, so he was just recently profiled by Sanjay Gupta on 60 Minutes, but uh, some of you may have heard of him. He's been on, um, he's gotten some funding subsequently from major uh, philanthropic organizations. But to date, and this is a key thing, math, how many people here have thought about how do we teach math better? How much, how much effort and resource has been developed, devoted to teaching math better? And yet with this relatively innovative, simple concept, what he brought to the table was something which was very basic, which is he could explain things clearly. We should not underestimate the power of explaining things in comprehensible ways to normal people. We generally do not do a good job of that in health policy. To date, Khan Academy has delivered over 300 million lessons, 6 million unique visitors per week, and they have online 2 million problems are solved. So I'd like to move to our first idea here, which is currently in development, which is we have partnered with the Khan Academy. We will develop a health policy curriculum for the, uh, actually for anybody, but really with the specific idea of connecting with people who need it the most, who are frontline clinicians, medical students, residents, and clinicians of any type. We, you know, we talk about doctors. It doesn't have to be just doctors. Nurse practitioners, pharmacists, nurses, anybody involved. We are going to try and educate them. So we've already developed the first of several tutorials. Uh, this is a simple chalkboard tutorial explaining what Medicare is. Again, very simple. I mean, most of you probably know what Medicare is, but it is surprising how many people don't. We believe that addressing this educational gap is the first step 
in actually then productively engaging clinicians in sustainable change. Our goal is to educate at least 10,000 providers uh, in some capacity uh, uh, over the next few months, and we'll be launching this in January. There'll be more to come on that. But what is the point of educating people? What are we trying to actually accomplish? And that's what I'd like to move to now for the second step. We talk about the SGR, and I think that this dramatizes what the issue with the SGR is. Many of us who actually practice feel that we're on this carousel. You know, you're always asked to see more patients, see them faster, run up the chart. You know, every month, you know, we're asked to increase productivity. This is not a fun way to practice medicine, and this is what people refer to when they talk about physician burnout. It's funny because on the one hand, you talk a lot about physician burnout, and this means a lot to physicians. To the regular public and to the public at large, I have to say, I always am a little worried to talk about this because they're, they're not very sympathetic to people making two hundred to $600,000 a year, but we'll leave that alone. Nevertheless, look at this right here. The actual amount that Medicare pays for services, and this is taken from a piece that Mark McClellan, John O'Shea, and I just published in uh, JAMA yesterday, uh, the amount we actually pay for services has not changed at all. Prices are not the issue, and yet the cost per beneficiary is skyrocketing. Doctors do more things to people more often, and this is this kind of endless treadmill of running up volume. Nobody likes this. I mean, we may talk about it, uh, saying people are not excited about fee uh, going away from fee-for-service, but that is simply because no one has shown them a better way. And that is the key to what we will try to do as the next step of our clinician engagement project. Again, this is not rocket science, but people need to be given examples. Doctors, clinicians want to do the right thing, they just don't know how to get there. I'll give one example. This is uh, Secretary Sibelius giving a talk at Gallup Indian Medical Center in Gallup, New Mexico. This is a large uh, tertiary care facility serving Navajo uh, Americans. Uh, living in New Mexico. I worked there for several years as a pediatrician. One of the things we found um, was that when you go to the doctor's office, you know, you sit in the waiting room, what, people just kind of hang out there and you wait for a really long time. We decided to make the waiting room into a learning room. So right here, this is, uh, you can tell by the technology there, that this is a little while ago. But at the time, this was really cool. We uh, bought a touch screen, I wrote all these computer programs, and we educated people when they came in on well child care, car seats. We, uh, I'll show you some of the screens we made up. You can see, you know, how do you put the car seat in your car? Most people don't do that right, you know, if you've ever. How do you put your baby to sleep on the back or the, or the, or the front, you know, to avoid sudden infant death syndrome? How do you take care of their teeth? It was a half hour module. It was the complexities using an ATM machine, and we substantially improved both knowledge and practice. We published this in um, the archives of pediatrics um, a couple of years ago. And yet, when I left there to start a fellowship in cardiology, that went away. Why? Because there was no sustainable payment mechanism there to keep it in place. Why we don't talk about, when we start talking about healthcare economics, doctors turn off, but you realize these kinds of innovations are happening every day throughout the country, and yet they are coming up, they make a lot of sense, and then they simply disappear because we have not created ways to make them sustainable. Our job is to publicize these things and find ways to take that natural innovation that pervades most physicians' medical practice and give them a path to success. I'll give another example. This is not rocket science. This is John L. Sasser. He's holding a picture of his son, Michael, who uh, last year was playing football in Sutton, Massachusetts. He suddenly, horribly and tragically collapsed and died during football practice. He had been entirely healthy before then. It turned out he had a rare genetic condition um, which causes a risk of sudden death. This is every parent's nightmare. You want to do something about it. Many academic societies have worked on this problem before. One of the theories that's been proposed is we should screen individuals to see if they have this risk. Now let's take a look at it through the traditional ways of doing this. Fee for service. If you brought in, say, 150 athletes, just doing an exam costs a lot of money. Doing an EKG costs a lot of money. And not only that, the EKG is not very good. It says, oh, there might be something wrong. They need to do an echocardiogram. That costs a lot of money. Screening 150 people could cost any, around $50,000. Simply because of this financial reason, most people think this is a bad idea. It's not cost effective. Why should we screen high school kids for this problem? Think about it that way. 
Now, adding to this, to this concept, this is not rocket science, this is Gracie Sultanian. She's an 11-year-old girl. She emailed me a couple of months ago, said, I have this idea. That young man was a family friend of mine. I think we can actually go ahead and check people for heart problems. Will you help me? I said, sure. So this past Saturday, we held a large screening at Sutton High School where that young man died. We screened 150 individuals. And you can see right here, that's in the um, principal's office right there. These don't project very well. We set up an EKG machine there. EKG machines you can buy on eBay for 50 bucks, by the way. That's an echo machine right up there. We got one that was sort of uh, outsourced a little while ago. We rented it for a couple hundred bucks. I volunteered four or five hours and got a couple of my friends to as well. We did it for a cost of zero dollars. Again, that is what innovation is about. It is not rocket science. An 11-year-old girl thought of ways that we could have surmounted this very, very controversial topic. You know, the American Heart Association is getting involved. The European Olympic Committee says, you know, we should. These are solvable problems. And yet, think about it, this is not sustainable. I can't volunteer doing this every Saturday morning for the rest of my life. And every time you, it's amazing how many new high schools want to have this done. And yet, think about it, we can think of ways to make this sustainable. When we talk about payment and delivery reform, this is how we need to speak with physicians. This appeals to their willingness to do the right thing. And this is what we're talking about ultimately when we're talking about SGR reform. It is going away from that fee-for-service treadmill that says this is all impossible and saying think of ways you can make it happen. I'll close with this picture before we move on to those specific ideas. This is a slide that was sent to me from a friend of mine who works for Partners in Health, which is an aid organization working in Haiti. That is a young man, 16 years old, who's HIV positive in Haiti. Again, can we treat those individuals with antiretrovirals in third world countries? No way, too expensive, cannot be done. It is unaffordable. It's not, he's not paid for by Medicare, but this is the same way of thinking. It's fee for service. You are locked into thinking of things being delivered in unit quantities. Paul Farmer and individuals said, we're not gonna do it that way. They negotiated very smart contracts to actually get these things paid for. That's the same young man several months later. So again, the same way of thinking, it's not just a local issue here, but we can think more broadly about how we can use resources to improve health. This is just, these are just three of many, many examples many of you can probably think of. How are we going to show people this path? And I'd like to spend the last few minutes talking about some of the work we're doing as, that is funded by the Richard Merck Initiative that we are gonna to try to use to move this forward. As I said, again, first we're going to try to address the knowledge gaps that are present, and secondly, we're actually gonna to try to give people a path forward. This is what we're talking about, right? A graph, we're gonna move from fee-for-service to the sort of value-oriented health commissions. But again, you look at this and immediately your reptile brain, if you're a physician, or not that the reptile, it turns off. But this is not how people think. It's not what moves people to really get inspired. And this is what we're up against. Uh, Farzad referred to the fact that only 7% of physicians are excited about getting rid of fee-for-service. Only 36% in that same study are excited about moving forward with new kinds of ways of paying for medical care. Now think about it. Nobody likes fee-for-service, but only a third of doctors want to actually go away from it or can see it. They need that path forward. How do we do it? It's the same way we get people to do anything. We tell them stories. You make a narrative. How do any of us get inspired to do anything? Somebody has to show you the way. Somebody has to tell you that it's possible. And it's fine. I'm gonna, this is what we're going to start with. This is a heart. I love hearts. Um, this one over there is a normal heart, and right here is one with the left ventricle, the red one, the big pumping chamber. That's the thing that, that squeezes and gets blood to your body. It's not working right. The muscle is sick. When the muscle is sick, it can pump only a little bit of blood with each time. So your body's very smart. It makes that muscle bigger. So that every time it pumps, even though it pumps a little bit, it can pump out the same amount of volume. This is heart failure. Now, Heart failure, your body is amazing. You, you're in a year, I mean, sort of in a lifetime, your heart pumps enough blood to fill an oil super tanker. It's amazing. So your heart is, your body's gonna do the best job it can to keep this even heart that's not working right for many reasons as you age um, from 
completely falling apart. But just like you heard earlier today from the story, there are some people who have fail heart failure, and so their hearts don't always work right. It is one of the leading causes of hospitalizations and medical expenses today. Can we do a better job taking care of people with heart failure? When they come into the hospital, under fee-for-service, you look at that, they just come in. In fact, the more they come in, the more you get paid. And again, this is not rocket science for most of you out there, but in a very, very real way, influences exactly how I practice medicine today and how all of my colleagues practice medicine. We don't think about, well, how do we identify those individuals right away? Do we set up care plans for when they go home? Who's going to follow up with them when they get there? Are we going to make sure they get their medications? When they start to feel sick at home, are we going to be proactive, have them come in to maybe get a medicine so that they can get rid of some of that extra fluid so they can stay at home? All of those things just don't happen today because we're not incentivized to do so. What we are going to do is the following, and this is the first of many steps. This doesn't look like a whole lot, but this actually saves lives. This is an alert that pops up. People in Texas wrote these very smart computer programs. You, you put them into your electronic medical record. They continuously troll who gets admitted to the hospital. They run through these fancy calculations, and they say, you may not realize this, but you have a patient on the fourth floor in the West Wing in room 338 who actually is going to have heart failure, even though they're admitted with pneumonia. This program would figure that kind of stuff out. And it would send an email to people at the hospital who are designated to be the heart failure specialist, say, hey, you need to go check on these people. And so they would do that. Now, as they did this, and they did several other things, and this actually, even though the program was developed in Texas, this is from a program in Colorado, has significantly cut their heart failure readmission rate by 30 to 40%, simply with this, prop, with this issue. Things, how are they going to get it paid for? In fact, you lose money with stuff like this, right? No. Imagine. So this is actually, this is where a bundled payment pilot comes in. You pay a fixed price for your patients with heart failure. And so what we propose to do is we're going to profile these types of centers. So we're, we started with profiling Colorado. We're profiling a Duke University program as well. We're going to tell their stories in a way that's comprehensible to people. We start with the patient. We then go to the physician who has these ideas. Then we talk to the administrator. Then we show, well, how do they actually get the payment models work out? Who's the economy? Who do you hire? We're going to show that whole pathway. We're going to propose it in a way that makes sense. These are, so what we'll do is uh, we will produce case studies made for clinicians, not made for health policy wonks. Um, we will use real clinical problems and stories from a wide variety of specialties. So uh, we're starting with heart failure, with asthma in children, infertility, colon cancer. We will show people how a, a way forward. Not only that, the idea is that it's not just that we show them a way forward, because everybody has ideas, but it's coupling that to the other work that we at Brookings are so good at, meaning to link this to payment reform to think about how you make this sustainable, to then advocate with the right people to actually make these so that it doesn't go the same way that our computer program on, on the Navajo reservation went. We will then, through these techniques, teach, well, what is a bundled payment? What are shared savings? What is a medical home anyway? People always say that, and I have to admit to this, I don't really even understand that concept. We will explain that better. We will show how it helps people and so on. And finally, what will we do with that? Writing papers is fine and dandy. I like writing papers. I read a lot of papers. But what we'll do is we will then change the way we present this information. So those of you who have been to or seen any pre uh, presentations from TED, I help, I've been involved in organizing some of the TED conferences in the Boston area. The way we present that is very important. It's presented narratively. You have a patient come tell the story, the clinician. but these. So that's how we will actually put this together. And ultimately, finally, then what we do is we plan to partner with edX, um, which is a collaboration between Harvard and MIT to create a massive open online class. We will open this to the world. So we will create ways of individuals and physicians, clinicians of all types, actually, to come and learn about these techniques. So probably planning an eight to 10 module course. In this way, again, we will finish with what the work we started, which is to first educate clinicians about the basic concepts and then build on that to show them a way forward. And in this way, we hope that we can start to make some of those changes that ultimately will lead to better medical outcomes from all people.
if we can reform SGR. Thank you. I'll just invite you off. If you're interested, I'm sorry. Um, that we will, if you if you are a Twitterish person, uh, we just uh, we we'll, if you follow us there, we keep you posted on our plans as we go forward. With this. Uh, thank you very much, Darshak, and uh, thank you all for participating in our sessions this morning. Uh, a, uh, a, a renewed focus and some new takes on progress with SGR and physician and clinician leadership in healthcare reform. We are now going to take a 15-minute break. The refreshments uh, off to the side of the room here. We'll reconvene at 10 o'clock with a panel uh, with uh, some of the legislative staff leaders in both parties and both chambers who are leading the efforts on SGR reform this fall. Thank you.